So today what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, you'll notice there's no demo equipment today, because today is, we're going to just dig our hands into the guts of the cadaver that is calculus and just do it. We're going to own it today, all right? So we are, <laughs> yay. <laughs> so we're going to solve problems involving complex distributions of charge. That's going to be our task today. And I will uh, attempt to demonstrate in itty bitty steps how to do this. I hope I will instill in you two things. One, do not be afraid to look stuff up. That is okay. Just tell me what you did. I used Wolfram Alpha to do this integral. I looked in Wiki Wikipedia and got this number. Just write your source down, okay? Just say what you did. In science, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something complicated. You just have to see if anyone else has done it before and acknowledge them, okay? And then just go ahead and use the result. So I want to drill that into you. Of course, I expect you to be able to set up and solve problems, that's a life skill. But, you know, the details of how you get that final number grinding through some hypergeometric function that you have to integrate, I promise I'm not gonna make you do that. I promise, okay. Those are all the way make grad students do those and they hate us for it, all right. That's been solved, okay. Probably like 13 Russians 40 years ago went into Siberia and fig figured it out for you so you don't have to do it anymore, okay. Somebody has done it, all right. There are lots of smart people in the history of the world and we have books full of their information. Right? We should use it, and you should learn to use it and not be afraid to use it as long as you say what you did. So let's go over the concepts again that we've kind of touched on so far. These are the core ideas we've walked away with. It all fits on a slide. Okay? There are two kinds of electric charge, positive and negative. They exert forces on each other. Positive, negative electric charges are the sources or recipients of electric fields. So by convention, electric fields emanate from positive charges and they go into negative charges. Okay, that's our picture, and that's how we describe nature involving charges present in nature. And it works very well, okay? Electric fields and forces are vectors. That's because they have both a magnitude and a direction. We saw that kind of dramatically last time with the Van de Graaff generator. I had that little piece of mylar in my hand, and as I moved it around, the tip of the mylar just kept pointing at that sphere, okay? You could really see the vector nature of the force there. There's a direction and a magnitude to this thing. So we describe it using a mathematical object called a vector. To find the total electric field or electric force, we add as vectors the electric fields or forces due to the individual charges. So imagine you have 10 charges, okay? That, you can do that by hand. That's awful, but you can do it by hand. To get the total force that the other nine exert on the 10th, you would sum up the forces from the other nine on that one. So you calculate the force of 1 on 10, 2 on 10, 3 on 10, 4 on 10, and so forth. So you wind up getting a sum from I equals 1 to 9 of the forces, the Coulomb forces of each charge on that 10th one. And similarly, if you just take the 10th away and ask, what's the electric field at the point where the 10th charge was due to all the other nine charges? Again, you would just write down the little point Coulomb electric field equation, and you'd sum those up as vectors, and you'd get a big vector. Okay, it would have magnitude, it would have direction. All right, any questions on those concepts? We're going to exercise this more today. All right. All right, so, so let's do some announcements. So your next assignment for class, you're going to keep reading Chapter 22. Um, I think we're going to finish it out. We're going to start talking about um, the actual effects that forces have on charges, electric forces have on charges. We're going to start throwing F equals MA into the mix. We're going to start looking at velocity and acceleration. We're going to do all that 1307 stuff, but now we're going to use this force to do it. Okay, you had a little sneak preview of that with the uranium nuclear uh, nucleus decay in the first homework problem set. Okay, we're going to build on that. And one of the things we'll do is uh, I introduced in the lecture video this thing called the electric dipole. That's just fancy talk for I have a positive charge, I have a negative charge. They have the same magnitude and they're separated by some distance. Okay, so that's what a dipole is. Okay, two poles, dipole. So one pole, another pole, equal magnitude charges, opposite sign, separated by distance. Uh, I introduced to you a you know typical dipole that exists in nature. Dipoles are everywhere. And we owe our existence and our near death to them. Okay, so I gave the example in the video of uh, the alveoli and the, the little layer of water that fills those sacs in your lungs. And if you don't have a surfactant in your lungs to lower surface tension, the dipole force in the molecules of water on the surface of that thin layer are enough to prevent an infant from taking its first breath. So its lungs would collapse and would not be able to reinflate. The dipole force is that strong. 
And we have to secrete a chemical called a surfactant to overcome that. Uh, prematurely born infants don't have that. So if you're born six, seven, eight weeks premature or more, you do not naturally produce the surfactant. It's one of the last things that's made by the body before you're born. So artificial surfactant has been around for decades, and it's simply sprayed into the lungs when the infant is born so that they can reinflate their lungs after they, take, after they exhale their first breath. Okay? So it's not the inhale uh, that's the problem. It's that first cry, and then they can't reinflate their lungs, and that's really bad. Okay? So premature infants have all kinds of issues. Physics plays a role in probably all of them in some way or another, and specifically in this case, the dipole force plays a significant role in your uh, chance of survival three seconds after you're born. Okay? You have to overcome that dipole force. The body has a way of doing that, but if you're born too early, it's not ready yet, and you can't. So thankfully, medicine has a way to overcome that. We've learned how to do that. All right? Okay, so uh, this actually, this statement here, uh, well, we'll get to this one first. Homework two is assigned today. Should already be up on Wiley. You should have an electronic copy of it. Again, look at your numbers in Wiley Plus. Uh, it's off the website. And there is a problem, again, that I wrote myself tacked on to the end. And I want you to hand in solutions to that one too, okay? Uh, that's, again, due in a week. Now, here's the start point. Teams are final star as of today. So starting tomorrow, what I want you to start doing is meeting with your team once per week outside of class. But I had to do a little last minute reshuffle. We had a late drop in the class and there's been some consternation expressed about their late uh, last reshuffle. So I'll probably move people back around again. So I think it's teams Delta and Echo. You'll be getting more emails from me, okay? So we'll sort that all out so people are happy. So let me, let me, let me state this. If there's anybody on team Echo that wouldn't bind, mind being moved to a different team, email me. That will make my job a whole lot easier, okay? So Team Echo was the big one, but we had a drop from another team. I'd like to kind of get the teams all equally sized at the beginning of the, of the course. Uh, of course, I can't predict future changes, of course, but uh, if anyone on Team Echo would like to be moved to Team Delta or wouldn't mind being moved to Team, Echo, to team Delta, I gotta move somebody. So just let me know that, you know, oh, I don't care. It's fine. I'm cool. Uh, whatever. I'll do whatever you tell me. I'm you know, sheeple, it's fine. So, all right, so your job, remember your homework for next week, next Tuesday, is just to select a team name. Oh, yeah, Sophie? Um, I think somebody was missing from ours. Do you have the list of yeah. people? Yeah, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna email all the teams so that everyone has everyone's email address, yeah. Uh, yes, so I will comment next week on uh, team dynamics and uh, leadership, and then we'll address some issues about people who are contributing and people who are not contributing, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? All right, because, you know, we're all human beings. We all commit different levels of things to activities. It's fine. I get it. But I've got to give the teams a way of dealing with this, right? So, uh, so you're going to select a team name. Remember the guidelines. I'm going to Urban Dictionary, things I don't recognize. Email it to me, and everybody on the team has to agree. So whoever emails it to me is CCing all the other members of the team. I'll get you your email lists for your teams today. Uh, I want you, when you meet, okay, so sometime between now and next Friday, you're going to meet as a team, in person, face to face, uh, and what I want you to just chat about is how does anything you've learned in this class, or even the previous class, inform one idea, one avenue of a solution that you could apply to the grand challenge problem, okay, that's it, that's all I want you to do in your first meeting, and if you come up with nothing, no problem, you got other meetings and we're going to talk as a team to mentor uh, kind of thing at the end of September, okay? Any questions? No? Okay, well then, let's do quizzing so that we can get to mathing. <laughs> Good stuff. You can tell the math. Okay, so we're going to check a claim at the beginning here. Uh, but let's go through the quiz questions first and discuss the, the answers to those. So let's look at the first one. As mentioned in the video lecture, what is the approximate typical number of charges in a macroscopic and eh, human scale, something in this room, a blob of matter? Okay, is it one, a million? Okay, two, a billion? Three, whatever the, that number is. Quadrillion? I have no idea what that is. I just wrote it down. Four, Avogadro's number. Okay, yeah, all right, so many of you went for Avogadro's number, and yeah, that's the number. And I think I, I, think I actually I put it wrong in the video. I think it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23 in the video. So I'm going to have to go in and do some careful video editing on that one and re-upload that YouTube video, but that ain't happening anytime soon. So I promise you that's the correct number. If I did say 10 to the 23, I apologize. And you know what? The jar. Yep, this is the jar. This is the famous error jar. 
I owe four dollars into this now. I already put one in and took one off the IOU last week, so it's there we go. The What's that? I, I, thought it, I think 23rd is correct. Yeah. Oh my lord. Okay, so that's the mistake. Either way, you're getting a buck out of this, so I'll fix that in the thing. Okay. Uh, so in that case, then we'll just have to correct by a factor of 10 something I write on a later slide. No problem. I should really not second guess myself at 7.30 in the morning. That's a bad tactic. So I'm going to recommend everybody just sleep past 7.30 in the morning and don't do what I do and get up early. Okay, good. Yeah, I've got at least one taker on that. All right, good. All right, so that will get fixed. And I will not have to do any careful editing in the YouTube video. And if this is all recorded so all my colleagues can see why I should have my PhD taken away from me. All right. So, question two. Which of these is a true statement about the electric dipole moment? One, its total magnitude is given by the magnitude of either charge, Q, in the dipole. You take yours for one. Two, its total magnitude is given by the separation, D, between the two charges. Take yours for two. Three, it points from the positive charge to the negative charge with magnitude QD, Q times D, and take yours for three. Okay, and four, it points from the negative charge to the positive charge with magnitude Q times D. Lots of takers for that. Yeah, indeed, group think worked here as well. All right, so it's number four. It's, um, it falls out of the derivation, uh, but the convention, if you just want to memorize it, is that this is one of the weird things where something starts on a negative and goes to a positive. Dipole moments, you start on a negative charge and go to the positive charge, and that's that P vector, which is equal to Q times D vector, and D just points from the, the negative charge to the positive charge in the problem. Okay. All right, so how do we determine the electric field of an arbitrarily shaped large number of charges? One, we always do the sum by hand, putting in one term for each charge, even if this takes forever. No one's going to jump on that one? Okay, all right. Two, we utilize integral calculus to perform a large sum more quickly. Eh, kind of few people. All right, fine. Uh, three, we can always just use Coulomb's law for the electric field and stick in the total charge Q. No one fell for that. Okay, four, we can't. There's no known way to handle large numbers of charges. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. All right, yeah, it's two. We're going to use integral calculus. In fact, we're going to exercise that today. Okay. All right. Now, uh, I made a claim, which I misstated and then restated correctly, thanks to help from all of you, and that is that this uh, Avogadro's number has something to do with sort of terrestrially scaled things. All right, so, so let's kind of test that claim a little bit right at the beginning. All right, so we're going to solve problems, first of all, involving uh, complex charge distributions. That's our goal for today. And I'll demonstrate how to set up and solve uh, a basic problem along this line, and then I'll give you a variation on that problem to try to do yourself. Okay. So let's talk about copper, all right? Let's, you know, we're thinking about matter, we're thinking about charges. You know, copper is made of copper atoms. We know that now thanks to hundreds of years of study of matter. Uh, you know, this is a, actually a very quite lovely picture of lots of copper wire laying around in little uh, spools, okay? A little copper tubing, something like that. Uh, so each of these is, you know, a few meters long and, and you know, a few, maybe 10 millimeters in diameter, something like that. Uh, you know, it's pretty much solid copper for the most part, so it's, it's fairly pure copper. Uh, copper is quite valuable as a commodity these days. Uh, well, during the housing bust, uh, when houses were abandoned, one of the most common things that was stolen from abandoned homes was copper wiring and copper piping. Because if you sell that for scrap on the black market, or really any market, just to scrap, you can make a lot of money very quickly. Copper is very valuable per unit you know, mass, basically. It's because we need it so much for electrical devices these days. It's so commonly used everywhere in computers and wall wiring and plumbing because of its thermal conductivity, which is very much related to its electrical conductivity. Uh, it's a very valuable metal, all right? So if, uh, if you have some net charge, big Q, that's deposited on the copper wire. Well, copper is a very, very good conductor. So if you put free charges onto neutral copper, they will be free to move anywhere they want in the copper material, and they'll kind of move until they come to an equilibrium place where all the charges are equally pushing on one another and they can't move anymore, and they stop. So you have to wait a little bit, maybe a billionth of a second or a millionth of a second or something like that, but eventually the charges will settle out at equilibrium and they'll be distributed over the copper, uh, primarily on the surface, and then they'll just stop moving. They can't leave the copper, but they can move freely on it or through it. And they'll do that until they come to equilibrium. Um, now that charge, Q, that we've deposited on here, it could be made from some huge number 
of elementary point charges. And re you know, remember the elementary charge is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which is a tiny number. Okay? Now, are there really typically like Avogadro's number or thereabouts of like atoms and charges just in stuff that we find around us all the time? So this morning, um, using the wrong number for Avogadro's number, as we'll correct that in a second, I went and checked that out. Okay, I mean, I, I've checked this before. I've done it a variety of ways. This will come up again in the course later with an exercise we do later on. Uh, but you can just check this. You can, you know, back of the envelope, very quickly on a small piece of paper, kind of look up some numbers and work out, is this true? All right, so as the famous physicist Richard Feynman once said, shut up and calculate. If you want to answer this question, just get some numbers and do some math. All right, so let's get some numbers and do some math. All right, so let's consider a lamp cord. All right, typical cord, you know, much like this camera uh, cable here. It's got some braided copper wire inside of it that's used to carry information from the camera back to the device and actually some information from the uh, device back to the camera because there's a little light on there that comes on when it's recording and so forth, okay? Now, you know, imagine that a typical lamp cord is something like, I don't know, a couple of meters long. So I said two for the purposes of this problem. I just pulled these numbers out of nowhere this morning, okay? And it's entirely made from copper metal. Keep this nice and simple. It's pure copper. So the typical thickness of like an electrical cord, and you can look this up if you want on the internet, but in the United States we use something called the American wire gauge, which is a bunch of standard numbers that represent diameter thicknesses of wire. And a, a very standard thickness for house wiring is 14 AWG, American wire gauge. And that corresponds to a roughly 1.628 millimeter diameter. All right, so house wiring, if you were to, you know, got the walls here and look at the electrical cables behind the, the, the wall, you'll find that the majority of them in this building are 14 AWG. We'll figure out why that is a little bit down the line with some homework, but that's a very standard number in American construction, and you'll see why later. Okay, it actually has a physics reason for that. Now, the density of copper is 8.96 grams per centimeter cubed at standard temperature and pressure. Do you think I just know that number off the top of my head? No, good. Weston, right? Yeah, so how do you think I got that number? I Googled it, that's exactly right. And then I found Wikipedia, and Wikipedia told me the number, okay? You know, Wikipedia can be wrong for some, some like, political things, but for like science things, it's basically pretty solid. So don't be afraid to use Wikipedia to look up basic information about the cosmos, like the density of copper. There's not a lot of debate about that anymore in our society, okay, because you can, you know, measure it and stuff. All right, so I just looked that number up. Now, of course, that probably needs to be converted to kilograms per meter cubed, and I think if you do that, it comes out to 8960 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so it's pretty heavy. It's a lot of kilograms for a meter cubed of copper. Copper is not light. Okay, if you've ever tried to pick up any significant amount of copper, you'll know that. Okay, so we've got a density, but we want to get a mass. And once we have a mass, if we know the mass of a copper atom, we can figure out how many copper atoms are in that cord. So we've got to get the volume of the cord. We've got to use that with the density to get the mass of the cord. Okay, so the volume of the cord, if we just approximate it as a long two meter cylinder with a cross-sectional area of radius one half the diameter, you can plug in numbers and solve. So vo volume will be area times length, and that's for a perfect circle gonna be pi r squared times L. And then if you plug in the numbers, you should get, if I did this right, 4.16 times 10 to the minus six meters cubed. So a teeny tiny volume. Not a big surprise, it's a very thin cord. It's long, but it's very small, okay? So it's small in meters cubed. I mean, a cubic meter is, you know, big, right? A lamp cord doesn't fill a cubic meter, okay? All right, so we have that, and we have that the total mass, then, of the copper metal is just the density, which is kilograms per meter cubed, times meters cubed will give us the mass of that cable. And we find out that the mass of that cable is about, you know, 37 grams, so 0 0.0373 kilograms. So not that heavy, but you'd be able to feel that in your hands. All right, so carrying that number with us onto the next slide, so that's just repeating what I wrote on the last slide right there, we can keep going. If we want to find the total number of copper atoms in this cable, we've got to divide by the mass of an individual copper atom, and that will give us the total number. All right, so the mass of a single copper atom is 63.546 atomic mass units, or AMU. Now, did you know you can do numerical conversions on Google? How many people knew that? Okay, a lot, actually. Yeah, so you just, you can even talk it into Google, but I just typed it. I said 63.546 AMU in kg, 
and it converts immediately to 1.055 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. So what uh, Google has done is behind the scenes, they're running a program called UNITS, U-N-I-T-S. It's a standard program on the Linux or Mac OS Unix operating system. So if you have a Mac computer and you pop up a terminal and type UNITS, you'll get a little prompt and it'll say, what do you want, what do you have, and what do you want? And you can convert just about anything to anything else. And if you try to convert like meters cubed to meters squared, it will tell you what the correct conversion factor is to handle that. Okay, it's pretty cool. And it's got hundreds, if not thousands of units in it that you can transform. Between. So if you need to get from one unit to another and you don't trust yourself going from centimeters cubed to meters cubed in your head or even on a piece of paper, check it with units and see what you get. Okay, check it with Google and see what you get. All right, so, uh, so that's the number I got. And if I just divide the mass of the wire with the mass of a single copper atom, I find out that I have 3.5 times 10 to the 23 copper atoms, which is within a factor of two or thereabouts of Avogadro's number, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, 6.02 times. Yeah, you're nodding your head, Weston, because you know I'm such, I'm such an idiot that I screwed that up. This is good, all right? Yeah, so that's within about a factor of two, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is Avogadro's number I learned today, okay? So I said 20 here because I'm a moron, and I'll fix that in the slides before I upload them, all right? All right, so that ain't bad for approximating. Factor of two, you know, for that many things in something we just kind of winged it on in terms of, oh, it's a lamp core, two meters long, it's got 14 AWG, here's the mass of a copper atom, go to town, okay? So if you then ask, well, fine, great, so how many charges are in there, how many electrons or how many protons, you can look that up in Wikipedia too. Stable copper has 29 electrons and 29 protons. So the, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the total number of electrons, I really shouldn't do things before eight in the morning. Uh, total number of electrons or protons then was just 29 times the number of copper atoms. And that comes out to be 110 to the 25, okay? And that's a factor of, that's again within a factor of about 20 or so of uh, Avogadro's number. So that's pretty good for this kind of quick, quick work. So when somebody asks you how many atoms are in that table, you can just say, well, about Avogadro's number. How many atoms are in that bottle? Well, about Avogadro's number. It's basically right to within some factor of 10 or 20 or 2 or 3 or something like that. I mean, you'll basically be right. And that's just because we're macroscopically sized and this number is meant to represent the rough number of atoms in a macroscopically sized object. So that's no accident, okay, by the way that Avogadro's number is defined. All right, so that claim kind of holds some water, all right? And we can use that especially going forward if we're going to estimate things. If somebody asks you to estimate something about a piece of material and you don't know how much stuff is in it, you can just wing out Avogadro's number and go from there and just say, look, I assumed Avogadro's number. We can correct that later if I'm wrong. All right, so what happens if you have Avogadro's number worth of charges that you have to add up and get an electric field for? That's the problem we're going to tackle today. And we're going to do it using integral calculus. Integral calculus is just a shortcut trick using the basic ideas of calculus to divide up a problem into many, many equally sized small pieces add them all up, send the piece size to zero, and see if you get a finite result, a non-infinite or non-zero result when you're done, okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to look at sort of the lamp cord problem again, all right? So now, imagine I have a, a, a bare lamp cord. The copper is just exposed, and I, it's infinite in length, all right? And so why do I get to do nonsense like that? Why do I get to say infinite? Well, you can approximate very long things, especially if the scale of everything else in the problem is teeny tiny compared to it. You can approximate the size of the big thing as infinity and see what kind of answer you get. And then later on, if somebody says, well, there's no such thing as infinity in nature, at least not that we've really encountered so far. So really, it's finite in size. What happens if you assume it's actually finite in length? It's only 10 meters long instead of infinity long. Well, as long as the, the problem you were originally kind of considering had a small scale and a big scale, and that big scale is way bigger than the small one, you'll find out that the corrections to your assumption are fairly tiny, less, maybe less than a percent level. So who cares at that point? And why the plus won't even care at that point? Okay, it won't care that you're off by tenths of a percent. It cares that you're off by a percent, all right? So calculus lets us, along with just sort of the basic tricks of mathematics, the little toolkit of mathematics, it lets us take a seemingly complicated problem, bust it into many equally sized small pieces, add up all the pieces, and get a result. And if you tried to do this by hand, which you're welcome to try doing, adding Avogadro's number worth of charges together, uh, if you tried to do it by hand, you'd never solve the problem. 
you can't count to Avogadro's number in your lifetime, even if you count it as fast as you humanly possibly could. Okay? So, let's see if we can tackle a problem that involves a large number of charges and throw calculus at the problem and try to make progress that way. So this is the picture. We have deposited a charge, Q, uniformly on an infinitely long copper wire. All right, so we throw this charge onto the copper wire, we wait a moment, we let it all settle out into equilibrium, and so it's nice and uniformly distributed over this, this shape, this line, this copper wire, okay? And now what we want to do is we want to just pick a point in space, call it P. Point P is going to come up all the time, all right? We're going to pick a point, point P, and we're going to ask, what is the electric field due to all that uniformly distributed charge at that point P? All right, well, if this was just a point charge with magnitude Q located here, you'd know exactly what to do. What would you do? Anyone? Anyone want to take a crack at that? Winston? If you just had a point charge sitting below the point P and you wanted to get the electric field, what would you bust out to do that? Coulomb's law. Yeah, Coulomb's law. Now, yes, for points, you always are going to use some, some version of Coulomb's law. And for the electric field, I'll just jot this down here. The electric field for a point charge is equal to K times the charge of the point charge Q over your distance from the point charge squared times a unit vector that points from the charge Q to where you are observing the electric field. So that's Coulomb's law for the electric field. It's very similar to the original Coulomb's law for force, but we've divided out the second charge, the one that would be sitting at point P, the test charge. Let's keep that in mind. Let's hold on to that equation. I'll leave it up on the board. Okay, we're going we're gonna to need that again in a moment. But we don't have a point charge. We have a bunch of point charges, and Avogadro's number worth of them, distributed uniformly over this very thin copper wire. Okay, so we're going to treat this copper wire as infinitesimally thin. That is, it's only one dimensional. It has no extent in the vertical direction or out of the page. It only has extent in the horizontal direction. So we'll treat this as a perfect one dimensional thing. Okay, an infinite straight line. Now, when you uniformly distribute charge over something, you can ask, well, what's the density of charge per unit dimension of the problem. And the reason it's useful to do that is because this is often a constant in problems that you'll get for this course. Okay? So you can ask in this case, because you have a line, about the linear charge density. This is denoted by the Greek letter lambda, lowercase lambda. Okay, kind of looks like an upside down Y. And this is just equal to charge per unit length. Okay, so it has units of coulombs per meter. If you have a two-dimensional surface and you have a uniform charge density on that, you have a surface charge density, then it's coulombs per meter squared. If you have a volume, it's coulombs per meter cubed, and that's denoted by sigma, the Greek little lowercase Greek letters. Uh, sorry, that's uh, denoted by rho. Uh, sigma is the surface charge density. All right, well, we can ask, since this is a uniformly distributed total charge Q over the length of this thing, whatever it is, okay, which we're going to approximate as infinite, uh, let's for a moment just say that the length is some big number, L, whatever that is. So I would write this as Q over that big length, L, which later on I'm going to approximate as infinite. Okay? No matter what scale I look at that line, if I chop off a little piece of the line right here, okay? Let's call that delta x. So if instead I look at all the charge that's distributed on a little piece of the line, delta x, I then add up all the little charges in that little length, delta x, and I'll get some piece of this thing. We'll call it delta, delta q, okay? If this is a uniform distribution, I should find that this, the total charge, total linear charge density, because this is a uniform distribution and this thing is a constant, no matter what scale I look at it, 
it will be the same number. So if I pick a small piece of the line and look at all the charge in that small piece, I should still find that this equals lambda. No matter what scale I look at a uniform charge distribution, I always get lambda for a line. This is a helpful trick. This is how we're going to attack this problem later on. This is how we're going to go from one little charge to understanding something about the whole distribution of charge. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Linear charge density is a constant no matter what scale we look at this problem. Okay, well let's, uh, let's go deeper. Let me take a little section of the line here. So this thing shoots off to positive infinity over to the right. It shoots off to negative infinity over to the left. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at an infinitesimal tiny little piece of this. So let's just kind of denote that as this thing here, all right, this little sort of shaded thing here. All right, so this little thing here is an infinitesimally small piece of the line. This is known as a differential. Okay, in calculus speak. And it has a notation that goes with it. Uh, if we are denoting this, for instance, here as the x-axis, okay, well, let's put our line of copper with its charge on it on the x-axis. The little piece of length here will be dx. Now, that's not d multiplied times x. It's a singular symbol, and it means differential of x. Okay? So that's a single symbol. Now, sometimes you can manipulate these differentials like they're, for instance, parts of a fraction. Uh, people often get themselves into trouble with derivatives by thinking that like numerators and denominators will just cancel for no reason whatsoever. There are rules with derivatives, and there are rules with integrals that can often make the problem simplify as if it were involving little fractions. But you have to be careful to use the rules before you just go blindly canceling things out, right? So, if you see something like this, dx over x, do not do that. Don't say, oh, hey, the x cancels out and I'm left with d. Don't, don't. We're about to get into very bad territory at that point, okay? And then, then, I'll have to, then we'll have to meet outside of class and figure out why your solution went like that right afterward, okay? So treat that as a singular symbol, a single unit, all right? Just as you would say delta x. Okay, delta x is a symbol that means a, a small change in x. You don't cancel the x. You don't put delta x over x and cancel the x's, and we shouldn't do that here either. Now, this little piece of the line, this little differential of the line, dx, carries with it a little piece of the total charge, differential q, little dq. Okay? And let's imagine that we've looked at such a tiny piece of the line that this dq is a point charge. For all intents and purposes, we've zoomed in so far, we're looking at like a single charge inside the matter, inside the material. That dq represents a teeny tiny itsy bitsy little point charge, right? Maybe an elementary charge with size 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 or something like that, okay? Really small. So what we're gonna do is we're now gonna bust this line into a huge number of teeny tiny little pieces we're going to look at one representative piece. We're going to figure out all the stuff about it, just like you do with Coulomb's law. You have to figure out Q and R squared and R hat. You're going to figure out what those pieces look like for the representative part of the line. And then you're going to add them all up at the end using integral calculus. All right, you're just going to integrate. You're going to sum them all up. So let's do that. That little dq, let me uh, redraw the line over here. Okay. So here is my little dq. So it's dx, and it has a little charge dq. And let's say, here's my point p. Now, it's a little charge. Uh, little charges make little electric fields. OK? So I know that if I ignore all the other pieces for a second, that little piece of charge 
is going to make a tiny little electric field up here at P. And if I could just figure out all the little electric fields contributed by all the little pieces at point P, I could add them all up and get the total. I could do the superposition principle. Add up all the electric fields as vectors, get the total field. Okay, that is our strategy. That defines our strategy. So let me begin by dropping some coordinates on the problem. Here's the y-axis. We've already said that the line is the x-axis. Okay, and I've decided to put the origin of my coordinate system straight below point P. So point P lies on the y-axis. Let's keep going. We have a few more things we can draw here. All right. So we're going to have an R vector that goes from the thing emitting the electric field to the place where we're measuring it. That's the convention. R vector, R hat, they point from the thing emitting the electric field to the thing, to the place you're measuring that field. All right, so let's just go ahead and draw an arrow. There we go. That is the R vector for that little piece, dq. Just that one. Does every piece on this line have the exact same R vector? Why not? Why not? Because they move. Because they move, right. And so some of those pieces are going to be really close to point P, like the one dead, dead underneath it. That's going to be the closest any piece gets. Some of them are going to be really far away. Okay, so that hypotenuse of that right triangle, you can kind of see there, the, the, the height of it is the y, the length of it is the x, and there's the hypotenuse of the right triangle. That hypotenuse is going to stretch as you change position. But let's dig just an inch deeper into the ice on this one. Let's see what lies beneath. What is it that changes? when you pick a different charge on the line. Does the y coordinate change? Does the x coordinate change? Which is it? Weston, which do you think? The x coordinate changes. You think the x coordinate changes. Yeah, and you can, you can kind of see that. So if I pick a, another piece, let's say way over here, okay, and, and just for a moment I draw its r vector. I'm going to erase this in a second so we don't get confused. We see that it still has a component whose height is still y, the distance of the point above the horizontal axis. But this x is different than this x. So all that changes as you pick another thing on the line is the x coordinate shifts. This is helpful because it helps us think ahead that eventually what we're going to have to do is set up an integral where we sum over x coordinates over the pieces in x. y is going to be a constant. y never changes. y should not be part of your integral. Okay, because y is a constant, it never moves. Unless you change the point p manually and move it here. But then all the y's are still the same for all the pieces. All right, so you're free later on, once you get the answer, to move y around. You can make y one meter, two meters, half a centimeter, whatever. But for the purposes of the integral, y doesn't change. Because when we're adding things up, we're adding things up only along x. This is helpful. Okay, this will help simplify our solution later. All right, so let me... Uh, just get rid of that piece, get some space back for myself here. Okay. So we have a tiny little electric field contributed by a tiny little charge. I'm going to write that tiny little electric field as differential E vector equals K. It's due to the DQ. The DQ is R squared distance away from the point P. And there's an R hat vector for that DQ that points from the charge to the point P. The next step with a Coulomb's law problem, once you've got your coordinate system set up and you've written down Coulomb's law, is to do what? What are we? How are we going to attack this? This formula I just wrote down. Any ideas? Plug in what we know. Plug in what we know. Okay. Do we know K? Yes. Yeah. It's a constant. Never changes. Great. Now, dq, well, we just said dq is a piece of the, the line. Okay, but we've also got r's and r hats, and we don't know how to relate like charge and distance so that eventually we have something consistent we can sum over here. I mean, right now we're kind of summing over charges, and each of them is at a different geometric location, but I don't know how to get dq and r to talk to each other so I can add this up in a consistent, coherent way. I don't know how to add up dqs when I've got r's floating around. 
So we've got to find a way to relate R and Q. All right? that's, that's a problem we don't know how to solve yet. So let's see if we can attack each of these pieces and by doing so, come up with a relationship, a geometric relationship between what charge you're looking at and where it is. Okay, so let's start with uh, R squared. That's usually the easiest piece to deal with. It's just going to be the length of a hypotenuse squared. Well, I've written my coordinate system. I already told you before, you've got a right triangle with a height y, a base length x, okay, and a hypotenuse there, all right? So if I draw the components of R vector for the piece I've shown you here, it has a piece that points to the right and a piece that points up. And the length of that is just going to be, the length of it squared is going to be the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared. That's really all I can do at this point. I know that my point P is some height Y above the line. That's never going to change for this problem. Uh, I know that this particular charge is located some distance X away from the origin. So I write that down. And that's about it. That's about as far as I can go right now. Let's write down our vector. We need that in order to get our hat. So we might as well do that next. So our vector, I've already kind of sketched what it's going to look like here. It's got a piece that points in the positive i hat direction. It's got a piece that points in the positive j hat direction. So it's a distance x in i hat plus a distance y in j hat. And again, that's about as far as I can go with this right now. OK, finally, we have to do r hat. And to get r hat, I divide r by its magnitude. Well, this is going to look pretty. I got x i hat plus y j hat over the square root of x squared plus y squared. Ugh. Man, this is looking like crap. Like we've, I feel like we've gotten in a worse position now. We don't really know what's going on here. All right, so let's, let's write down what we've got. Clean some of the chemistry off the board here from the last class. All right, so let's see, let's see what we've done. I think we've made the problem worse. We've got DE vector equals K. Okay, we know what that is. DQ, no idea what's going on there. We got R squared in the denominator. So we got X squared plus Y squared down here. And then we've got this R hat vector, which is X I hat plus Y J hat all over the square root of X squared plus Y squared. Now we can go one step further and kind of group some things here. We've got We've got an x squared. I, I totally agree, Lucy. I've got an x squared plus y squared. It's fine. Trust me, that's, that's what's happening inside of me right now as I look at this. Okay. I got an x squared plus y squared here. I got a square root of x squared plus y squared here. I, I hope this looks familiar to people, but you can rewrite the square root in a suggestive way. You can take x squared plus y squared, raise that whole thing to the 1 half power, and that's equivalent to the square root. And when you do that, you see that now you're multiplying something with a power of 1 times the same thing with a power of 1 half. And so you can rewrite this as, I'm going to put this over here, de vector equals k dq all over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. If you're not sure what happened there, re review your fractional, review your addition of powers when you multiply things together. It's a fun weekend activity for Labor Day. Okay, and then you have your, your remaining numerator in the, in the unit vector, x i hat plus y j hat. Now, I feel like we've made this problem worse, but we are on the cusp of a breakthrough, okay? Because we have one piece we haven't dealt with, dq. Is there a way we can relate the little piece of charge occupying a little piece of length? Can we relate the charge to the length somehow through a number? Any ideas? Javon, you got any thoughts on this? Uh, Just trying to fly under the radar? Or, yeah. <laughs> I guess for any given length, it's going to have um, a charge with that ratio right there. Yeah. Bingo. Linear charge density. Linear charge density rides in and saves us. 
because this is a charge per unit length, and we know we've got a little bit of charge occupying a little bit of length. So lambda is going to be equal to Q over L, whatever that is, some constant. It will also be equal to DQ over DX. That little bitty piece of charge over the teeny tiny piece of length that it occupies, that's a constant. And so now we see we can relate charge and geometry. Charge is related to geometry, position in the problem. And that's good because now we see something very suggestive happen at the end of this. DE vector is K, and I'm going to kind of rewrite these things a, a little bit so you kind of see the, the calculus of it. X I hat plus Y J hat DX. So I put the DX, even though I could have put lambda DX up here, like I did here. I just moved it. You know, these are just numbers that are multiplied. I can move them anywhere in the product and it doesn't matter. Okay? So I just moved the DX off to the right, suggestively, because you, know, you may be familiar with, with uh, seeing something like you know, DY equals A DX. And if I want to get Y, Y is the integral of DY which is the integral of a dx. Okay, so if I want to sum up all the little functions of dx multiplied by a and get y, I just have to put that curly s next to it, right? And add up. So that's what we're about to do. Okay, we've got about as far as we can get setting up this little piece of charge in terms of coordinates, geometry, and constants. Coordinates, geometry, and constants. Once you've gotten it as far as you can go in those directions, it's time to integrate. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. That's as far as you can take that one piece, and now it's time to sum them all up. All right, we've used this. Don't worry, you're going to get to exercise this. Yeah, Lucy. Sorry, where did you get the dy? Oh, I'm just giving that as an example. Okay. So in, you know, in a calculus class or in a calculus video or something like this, you might see you know, something like you know, y is some function of x. So y equals a times x, whatever a is. Okay? And uh, the differential of y is a dx. And if you want to integrate those differentials, so does anybody know what the, I mean, the, this is like the simplest integral to do. You're just taking the sum of all the little pieces of y, and then it better return the length y when you're done, okay? That's the nicest integral you ever have to do in life. That is equal to the integral of a dx, whatever that is, okay? And that might be tough, or it might be easy. If a is a constant, it's easy. If a depends on x, it's not. And you probably have to go look up the integral or put it into Wolfram Alpha, which is a web front end to Mathematica, something like that, okay? I don't care how you get the integral. Once you get to this point, you're by three seconds away from solving the problem because you just have to integrate, okay? And how you do that, I leave up to you. You can do it yourself. You can look it up in a book. Uh, if books are a thing anymore, you can use the internet, use some program you purchased, just say what you did, okay? So to get the total electric field, E, I need to integrate all the little pieces, DE. And that means I need to integrate K lambda over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves, x i hat plus y j hat dx. So all I did to get to this step was put the integral sign in front of it and say, whatever that is, it's equal to the total electric field. That's just the definition of a sum. The sum of the parts equals the total. Okay? So there's the total. I want that. I have that. So I need to do something with that. Now, let me ask a question. If I gave you the following, A, let's see, AX, DX, oh, let's do it this way. AX plus BX squared. So there's some function of X. 
dx, and I told you to integrate that, what might be the first thing you would do to make your life simple? Take out the x. Yeah, you could take out the x. That won't make your life simple. Because now you'll have x multiplying another function of x. Awful. Because then you'll have to integrate by parts and, yeah, don't do that. All right. All right, so you've just made your life more difficult. I'll keep an eye on you. <laughs> You're one to watch. Please do. Please do. Yeah, okay, no problem. Any ideas? In? You're saying you can't take the derivative of that? What do you, I mean, you can, but I want you to integrate it. Distribute the dx. Distribute the dx. Okay, yeah, the dx is just a little, you know, it's a little infinitesimal number. And like anything in algebra, it can be distributed. So we can rewrite this as the integral of ax dx plus bx squared dx, and that just breaks into two integrals, ax dx plus the integral of bx squared dx. You can distribute. So there's really two integrals added together up in that funky looking thing on the right hand side of the electric field, okay? You've got an integral of x over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves, and you've got an integral of y over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves, both dx. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write that. Just going to do the same thing I wrote there in simple form with this nasty thing up here. Okay, so E equals, all right, well, K is a constant. Lambda is a constant. I'm tired of having my constants inside the integration. They're not going to participate in the integral. So I'm just going to yank them out in front. And I've got the integral of X over X squared plus Y squared to the 3 halves i hat dx plus the integral of y over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves j hat dx. Now, this is just a unit vector. It's just a constant thing that points. That's all it does, just points, points in the x direction. It's a constant too. So actually, let's just pull that out in front. Just get it out of the integral so we don't get all confused about what the hell that thing's doing in there. Same with j hat. j hat's just going to go in front of that integral. And we already see now how, you know, what's about to unfold in all of this. What's about to unfold in all of this is we're going to do this integral, and we're going to get the x component. And we're going to do this integral, and we're going to get the y component. And I'm going to put a bracket on the end so that I don't look like a slob. And then we're going to be done. Okay? So you're like this close to being done with this. The, the hard part about problems like this, and I don't mean to psych you out, right? I mean, I think you guys can all do this, okay? But if you want to sort of set back and go, where, where do I have to put the most brain power into a problem like this? It's setting it up. It's getting that, that thing to integrate in the first place. After that, it's just executing the rules of algebra and calculus, okay? Which gets rote after a while. The physics of it is going from the picture with charges to something mathematical that you can sum up later. So you have to use physics to get the thing you can add up, and then you just do math. All right, so because I would like you guys to play around with your own problem, uh, we're going to do this like a baking show, and then a miracle occurs and the cake comes out of the oven, okay? Before I show you what's going to happen in one of these integrals, let's step back and look at this picture again. Let's imagine that this is a positive charge that's distributed on this line. Okay, so all the little itty bitty pieces are also positive. And let's say I pick a piece over here, and I pick a piece an equal distance from the point P over here. And they have the same magnitude. They're both dq, they're both positive. The electric field from this one points where? Does it point toward the point P or away from the point P? It's a positive charge. towards point P, because positive charges are the source of electric field. So this electric field is emanating out in all directions. But if we're just at point P, there's a line that connects the electric field to that point P. All right, now what about from the symmetric mirror twin of that charge over here, equidistant from the origin, but over on the right-hand side? Where does its electric field point? Away. Away from point P? So like that? Towards. Towards, towards. yeah, because it's also a source of electric field. Okay, so the line of the electric field is converging on point P. They are equal in length, okay? Which of their components point in opposite directions, horizontal or vertical? Horizontal. horizontal. Yeah, the horizontal components are doing this. 
The vertical components are adding up or canceling out? Canceling. We'll do this again. Adding up. Okay, now you're doing the electric field dance. All right? Look at that. Nothing. Guys, it's Thursday. We're in like the second week of classes. More energy, please. I got 13 weeks left in me. What have you got? Okay, and I do this every semester. All right? Think about that for a second. It's like, it's like, it's like hell, right? You just do the same thing for 15 weeks every semester. All right? Thank you. Thank you for, for giving me some small semblance of joy in my life. Okay? All right, so yeah, so the horizontal components cancel out, and the vertical components add up. So what do we expect that integral over that thing in the x direction to equal? Zero. Yeah, well, you, you're not going to commit? You're not going to let everyone in the back row hear you? Sophie said zero, zero. so just in case we're wondering, OK? Yeah, so for every piece that's over here on the left, there's a twin piece on the right whose x component points in the opposite direction but is equal magnitude. And so without doing any math, all right, you just look at this problem and goes, there is a symmetry. There's an infinite line to the left. There's an infinite line to the right. So there's always going to be a twin charge over on the left for one on the right that cancels out an x component. I expect that integral to be 0. And in fact, if you plug it into Wolfram Alpha or whatever you want to do, you will find out that that integral is, in fact, if you do it, let's put some limits in here, symmetrically, from negative infinity to positive infinity, you'll find out that that is a big fat nothing. Zero. No x component in the resulting total field. Yay. Now you just have to do this one. This one, non-zero, because all the y components all point in the same direction and add up. Okay. Now they have different strengths as you go further and further and further away. But they all add up. And the result of doing this one if you work it all the way through, you will find that the total electric field is 2k lambda over y in the j-hat direction. Okay? So, y is not something that varies in the integral. But of course, you're now free to say, well, I'm going to move the point p twice as far away. Okay, so now, if I move, if I, let's say I start out at y equals 1 meter, and I move the point to y equals 2 meters. What happens to the strength of the electric field from this line? Does it double? Does it halve? Does it go down by a 4? Double the distance? What happens to the strength? Anyone? Fourth of it? Yeah. Fourth of it. Fourth of it? Is there a squared somewhere in there that I didn't notice? You double, no. Say doubling it would, if you square it, would go down by 4. But that's linear. So you double it and it goes down by two. Yeah. Okay. So what's kind of cool about this is while each individual charge, each little point in this thing, the force declines as a function of one over r squared. When you add them all up, they kind of reinforce each other. And so in fact, the electric field of the total only declines as linear. It falls. You go twice the distance, it goes down by half. You go four times the distance, it goes down by four. Okay. Not sixteen. All right. So that's just one of these effects when you get a bunch of charges together. You have to be a little careful. Watch your intuition. Read the equation. Make sure it says what you think it says. Okay. If we had a positive charge density, then the electric field would point in the positive y direction. We, we kind of saw that already when I was doing the dance. right? If we have a negative charge density, some negative q per unit length, then the whole thing flips. Okay, And you're in the negative j hat direction. So lambda can carry an additional sign if it's a negative charge density. That would flip it around. Okay. So what you wind up having here and I don't think I have a sketch of this, but I have it in the notes, is if you kind of imagine, here's the line, and you go anywhere around it at distance y, the electric field for a positive charge density will always radiate outward, and it will fall off linearly with distance. So this cord, if it's carrying a net charge, carries an electric field with it that radiates out uniformly in all directions around the long axis, okay, and it declines linearly. And so something to keep in mind is that all devices around you, right, that carry net electric charge through them, a current, they have electric fields that they're emanating. And so, you know, you have to keep that in mind when you're designing equipment. If you're going to put a patient uh, in an instrument that, you know, measures something about their electric currents or, or whatnot, you have to keep be mindful of the fact that you can disturb their own currents by using electric fields from your own equipment. So things to keep in mind, even in medicine, you have to be a little bit careful if you're using a new instrument. Has it been properly shielded against its own fields, 
for instance. Okay? All right, so here's the problem I want you guys to do for the rest of the class. It's a small variation on what we just did here. All right, so much of this will apply, but I want you to try to step through it on your own. Now the line is not infinite. It's finite, and it's all to the left of the point P. So imagine the copper wire is now a length L, but it's only to the left of the point P. Okay, it carries, again, a, a charge Q distributed uniformly over the length L, Get the electric field for this at the point P. All right. So your goal, your goal is to set up something starting from this point charge Coulomb's law, and you're going to try to get all of these pieces written in terms of coordinates and constants and geometry. Coordinates, constants, and geometry. I can't repeat that enough. That's what I'm looking for. All right. So you're going to set up this differential which can then later be integrated like we did here. Okay? So work together in groups. I want you to par partner up with two or three you know, people together. Work together, okay? And if you don't like the person you're sitting next to, then quietly you say, I'm going to go to the bathroom and then just shuffle to another row. All right? All right? All right? And I expect to hear talking. I want you helping each other, okay? And if you have questions, come talk to me. And if you need to build your chops in calculus, don't be afraid to meet with me outside of class. We can, uh, we can work through that together, okay?